Good afternoon. Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you about uh, how to create impact from open data and yeah, a little bit about the ODI. Um, you know, the Open Data Institute, we're here to catalyze the evolution of open data culture to create economic, environmental, and social value. Um, now, what that really means is it kind of means opening, answering the so what question for open data. You know, and we, re we really believe that open data is something that can have real impact for everybody because we think it's a tool, not necessarily an end in and of itself. When I say impact, uh, you know, this is for everybody, you know, slightly cheating, using a picture of uh, Sir Tim uh, opening, uh, the opening of the Olympics. Um, I, I mean, it can have impact across all the sectors. So, uh, you know, you can have open data powered culture. culture. You know, one of the first things that uh, our chief executive, Gavin Starks, did when he, he joined the organization was he created uh, the world's first data as culture art commission. You know, brought in respondents from other countries, uh, um, a, a actually quite a staggering amount of uh, coverage. Powering things like this, this chap here. Every single light in this uh, thing is powered by a different sensor uh, in this guy's house. And my personal favorite, uh, this is the snack machine in the ODI. Uh, this does not accept money. This only dispenses crisps when, or chips when uh, there is bad financial news in the economy. You know, it mines all the headlines from BBC, from Reuters. Uh, and whenever someone's, you know, there's a headline like 10,000 people sacked uh, or laid off due to the downturn, then crisps fall out to cheer you up. Uh, this was a great snack machine a couple of years ago. Turns out it's, it's, it's less good in the, the upturn. Um, so I'm afraid, you know, budget bingo has got slightly more boring recently. Uh, we, we need to go back to the artist and try and refigure what was the data that drives this. Um, but it can also, you know, be a, a driver for efficiency savings. So I think uh, Victor, one of the previous speakers, uh, mentioned this. You know, op uh, open data. How identified a 200 million cash saving uh, in the NHS from switching from branded to generic drugs in one line. Now, this is something that wasn't news to the sector. The whole debate about uh, branded versus generics and care pathways and all, all of that stuff has been going on for uh, years in the NHS because nobody likes wasting money. Um, this was the first time that you could look at a map and go, well, there doesn't seem to be any real correlation with things that you would expect. You know, it's not like the spending on branded drugs is particularly in London. So there's no sort of urban rural split. You can't identify the country, the major cities around the UK on this map. There's no particular north-south split. Um, there is a cluster in the northeast. Uh, anecdotally, that's uh, around um, particularly good uh, drugs rep, uh, who's who's very good at selling. Um, but if if you if you believe that this is just random noise, then this is a 200 million cash saving identified by, in the NHS at a time when the NHS is strapped for money and strapped for cash, uh, for roughly the same clinical output outcome. Um, now, success would be if I was able to stand here and say, and yes, we did this in six weeks with one of our startup companies, Open Healthcare, uh, as part of the partnership, Ben Goldacre in there to make sure it was all active. And now the NHS is using this service. You know, having found a 200 million cash saving, the NHS picked up the phone and said, you know what, we want to buy that off you. Can we take that insight? And do you mind doing this for another 20 different classes of uh, drugs? Uh, and that will be our phase one program. Um, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, it is starting, you know, about 18 months after we did, after the analysis happened, it's starting to happen. Next example I want to talk to you about is uh, in the world of regulation. You know, I mentioned on the panel uh, just before lunch um, that open data has the power to transform how th markets are regulated. Now, this is uh, a map um, which shows you 
uh, how the world looks according to Goldman Sachs. You know, every single point on this map is a subsidiary of Goldman Sachs. They have a, at least a 50% equity holding. The data powering that comes from three different regulators across the United States. So no one regulator in the States could do this analysis. Um, but because of the presumption of open, all the data is there. And you can, if you look at the map, you can see some of the major countries there. You know, I can identify the USA. There's uh, the UK hiding underneath a cluster. There's uh, islands. Uh, I think it's Holland that's hiding under that point of yellow. And that big country that looks a bit like a flexing arm, uh, that's the Cayman Islands. Uh, that's the first time I knew the Cayman Islands looked like a, a flexing arm. Knew Italy looked like a boot, didn't know the Cayman Islands looked like that. And I will leave you to draw your own conclusions as to why the Cayman Islands is about half the size of the United States in terms of uh, Goldman Sachs corporate structure. But this is the, 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 the insight here is that this was the first time all of that information had been brought together, and it was able to be brought together because all three of those regulators was publishing it as open data. Open Corporates, the company that did this analysis, they didn't need to ask anyone's permission. They could just do it. Continuing on the regulatory theme, uh, another thing that's really powerful is being able to use open data to have a grown-up relationship between the industry and with uh, the regulator. Now, this is some analysis we did last year. Uh, we did this ourselves rather than with one of our, uh, one of our startup companies. Uh, and we did this in partnership with the Bank of England and the peer-to-peer -peer lenders. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with peer-to-peer -peer lending, um, but just in case, 10 years ago, the peer-to-peer -peer lenders went to the Treasury, the Bank of England, uh, all of the, the FSA as it was, um, and said, hey, it's just people lending to people direct on the internet. We do not need to be regulated as a bank. It's, it'll be fine. There aren't very many people. We'll let you know if it all goes wrong. And uh, they did manage to get themselves a new light touch regulatory regime for this new innovation online. And it's been massively successful. In the last 10 years, there's been double digit growth in this industry to the point where Zopa now have 1% of the retail loan market and they still have that double digit growth. So it's not gonna take them another 10 years to get to 10%. Um, and the regulator was kind of looking at this and going, well, hold on, you said this was small. Uh, this is now a meaningful amount of money. Um, do we need to increase the amount of regulation? Possibly to the level of banks. And, you know, bank regulation, very effective in the UK. Uh, we definitely didn't have to bail them all out. And it's been so effective, there's been no new entrance in uh, the bank industry in, I think, about 80 years until two started last year. Um, so what we did was we went, well, this is an interesting problem. You know, Bank of England thinks about, is thinking about increasing regulation. Bet the peer-to-peer -peer lenders aren't, aren't keen on this. Is there an open data solution? So we, we, we spoke to the lenders and we, we found one. You know, we found, uh, they opened up data from their loan book. We analyzed it and you, know, you could see at a glance what was going on in the market to the point where the Bank of England, if they wanted it, could have had a, a big screen on their wall showing them real time what was the lending that was happening across the UK. Um, and to, you know, that directly fed in to them saying that the uh, regulatory regime was working. You know, this was uh, a market where they could ha take a data-rich, regulation-light approach. It can be used to uh, analyze financial flows. You know, this, this is, uh, again, one of our startup companies, Spend Network. They took uh, data from the European Union and from a number of different countries about what they were spending where all of the tender information that was put out on EU portals and showed that there was uh, 22 billion pounds worth of cash flow delay to the UK economy, a time when the, the UK government was saying that they were trying to buy from small business and they were trying to make sure that the money flowed through as quickly as possible so that the cash flow supported British industry. And it can become uh, useful in uh, a sort of policy debates you know, how often have we, we seen debates uh, where one side says this is a wonderful thing, another side says this is awful, the world is going to end, and it's completely data light. You know, there is no evidence on either side. 
And we, we saw uh, this type of assertion-based debate going on last year uh, with fire station closures in London. You know, it's a really emotive subject. These are, uh, because of uh, the, the, the constrained uh, position in, in public spending in the UK, you know, there are cuts needing to be made, fire stations needed to be closed. Um, and this is where the fire engines come, that come and put you out when you're about to die. Um, so, you know, you had unions on one side saying this is a disaster, the GLA and mayor on the other side saying this is, it, it's, it'll all be fine. And we thought, well, let's inject some data into this, this debate. Let's, let's inject some analysis. Let's see what the answer actually is. Um, and uh, Telefonica, one of our members, they opened up their, um, their, their, their sort of aggregate telephone location data. So for the first time, we weren't just reliant on the census, where do people live, but we could say where people are. Um, so we uh, ran the numbers, you know, did, modelled it, you know, what happens if the fire stations are alive, what happens if the fire stations are closed, uh, and it turns out that actually the proposed change was a rational one. Um, but we were, we were able to sort of surface that, and uh, this is quite almost like the, uh, the beginnings of what a smart city uh, could look like. But this is, you know, it's been a big year for open data. Um, it's been a year where the examples, like the ones that I've just put up, which are very UK focused, are starting to become global. You know, we're, almost, we're at a, a unique moment in the, the, the evolution of open data. You know, last year, uh, when they met, the G8 signed uh, an open data charter. They committed to opening up their data, opening up the core data sets, and uh, starting to use it. We've got emerging standards. We've got things, people, talk, people doing things like Wikidata, solving problems about versioning and uh, you know, so solving some of the technical challenges here. Um, and what we're seeing is we're seeing the beginnings of a global movement. So this is why um, we think it's quite important that we've uh, joined a partnership uh, for open data with the World Bank and with Open Knowledge um, to support countries and de uh, sort, support developing countries in joining that revolution. Support them in uh, building their capabilities. Support them in, in the choices they need to make about platforms and also about thinking through how, what are the examples that like, like the ones I've just put up on screen, what are those examples and use cases that they want to see emerging? Um, and this is uh, just going to a bit of, bit of detail on one of the, the countries we've worked with. Uh, this is Burkina Faso. As you can see, they do have open data. They have a big sign outside the government headquarters saying they have 17 policemen. Um, and what we did was we, we they, they approached us, they said, uh, you know, we're really interested in this open data thing, but we don't know where to start. So we went out, we, 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 we helped them, we gave them some advice, helped them create an action plan. Um, but all, all, in, all the time, empowering them to help themselves. And what they've done is they've uh, taken education as their big, as their big theme. You know? uh, they have a burgeoning education uh, sector. Uh, you know, Burkina Faso was the, the third poorest country, according to the UN. Um, so, edu you know, they're starting from a, a low base, but there are some new schools coming. Um, and that's, importantly, they had the beginnings of a data ecosystem. You know, so they had some data about, like, how many women are in this, in this school. They had some information about how, how good is the school, how, how much uh, are they helping to bring people along. They didn't know the locations of the school, uh, so one of those little things that we did as we went along. Uh, was uh, we got the military to lend the person in charge of education a GPS unit. So he could go around tagging the schools and the school locations. Uh, you may think this is silly, but you know, that was a big value add for us. Um, but once now they've got the data, they've opened it up. Uh, what they've done is they've, they've opened it up, not just so that people can have choice about their schools, but also so the donors and the people who are you know, basically building schools in Burkina Faso, know where they ought to be living. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, correction from the floor, this is not the number of policemen, this is the phone number for the policeman. 
Um, thank you very much. I will now amend my talk uh, for the future. Um, so, uh, yes, now they have the data about the education system. Um, they've opened it up, and they've opened it up so that the donors can see where the schools are, where they're effective, and importantly, build the schools where there are the gaps, not build the schools where they've uh, seen success from someone else. Um, so this is, this is, for them, transformative in where they get inward investment. Now, as it's a, a global community that uh, is being built, then uh, we're starting to scale up uh, the ODI. We now have uh, operations in 20 countries, uh, sorry, 20, op 20 different centers of operations in 14 countries and four continents around the world, uh, starting to sort of provide some of this support that we, we offer around training, around corporate membership, around startups, uh, to nurture this community of people working with open data to create impact. And that's something that we uh, you know, hope to see driving some of the, change, some of the uh, benchmarks and performance in countries in benchmarks around the world. So this is uh, something called the Open Data Barometer. There is also an Open Data Census. Uh, so the census counts the number of data sets that are open. This is looking into um, some of the, 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 starting to get into the impact side. So, um, I, I, one of the, the measures here is around you know, how much social impact is there, how much economic impact is there, is the environment right, um, are the data sets created. And this is something that was done, uh, is done by the, the World Wide Web Foundation, um, and uh, we've done a very pretty visualization, uh, which you, know, you should click in and have a look. Um, so yeah, this, this is uh, something which is global, something which is growing, something where uh, I, you know, it's, it's creating a rich firmament for people to uh, work with. And it's, uh, you know, we, what we have now is we have a unique moment. I think this is why uh, the, the, the sort of, the, the tipping point with uh, Wikidata is important. You know, Wikidata, uh, we heard from uh, Marcel just before lunch, uh, is something which enables some of the feedback loops on data to work. You know, it enables versioning, it enables community maintenance, it enables uh, people to, to be able to correct over time and refer back to the source material. And this is something which, if you think this is in, against a global landscape of open data and a, a global environment, something which is going to be an amazing resource into the future. So, thank you very much.